Aloha, awina la. I'd like to welcome Aloha. you on behalf of Ihilani, who is our education coordinator. This series is her baby. She is at a workshop on Maui, so she's kind of sad she can't be with us today, but she gave her coworkers marching orders, what we were all supposed to do to help make this a real success. So I get to introduce Dr. Osorio. Dr. Jonathan K. Kamakavila Oli Osorio is a scholar of 19th century political and social history in Hawaii. Recently elected as Dean for the Kamaka Kaukuokalani Center for Hawaiian Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa, he has developed and taught classes in history, law as culture, music as historical text, and research methodologies for and from indigenous peoples. He is also a composer and singer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Osorio. Aloha mai kako, e na makamaka e na e na hoa kako o ke haleali haleali o iolani. And uh, I want to express my gratitude to you for your uh, for your service, um, not just to this organization and to this building, but to the Lahui, because what you do actually helps to continue to keep. Uh, in a very material way, um, the memories of our ancestors uh, and our chiefs alive. I want to introduce my uh, daughter, Halia. Um, she has a very long name, too. Uh, longer than mine. Um, Halia is visiting from, um, from, she's not visiting, she's home for the summer, that's right. I, she's home for the summer from, from college in Colorado. And she agreed to come and help me um, move through this through the slides of this, so I don't have to do more than one thing at once. Uh, before I talk about this this um, this talk, I'm going to open with um, with a hymn that a himeni that I wrote with um, Kanalu Young. Actually, the first time we ever performed it in front of people was um, at the bandstand um, in. It was probably December of 1992 at one of the preamble kinds of um, events that took place before Onipa'a um, in 1993. And this is a song, the song is entitled uh, Pule no Ke'ea, or A Prayer for Sovereignty. And whenever I sing this, I, I, I try and get people to understand that um, the lyrics that were composed mostly by Kanalu Young um, the late Kanalu Young, my friend and fellow uh, professor at Kamakaku Okalani. The, the lyrics really are a prayer for, um, for the Lahui to recognize what, a, what a, an important moment that was, um, that recognition of the 100th anniversary of the loss of our kingdom, and to recommit ourselves or to commit ourselves uh, to the securing again of, of our national government. And of course, that was. 25 years ago. Um, in many ways, I think we have secured everything maybe but that government in the last 25 years. And I have no regrets about what we have done or what we have achieved. I have no regrets about what we have not achieved. I think there's something that needs to be left um, to the next generation.
I want to tell you a little bit about this paper uh, before I get started. Um, I, I know there are a number of lectures that I could have chosen to do um, for this gathering, and some of them come from a course that I teach called um, Post-Contact Chiefs of Hawaii that traces the, I should say I used to teach it, and now that I'm in administration they won't actually entrust me with teaching <laughs> young minds anymore. Um, but it's, it's a course that traces the, the leadership and sort of the biographies of the great chiefs and leaders from Kamehameha Paiea to Liliuokalani. So it's really a history of the kingdom uh, but really sort of focused on the lives of these ali'i. And, you know, I could have picked any one of, I don't know, I think there's 21 different lectures in this with PowerPoints. Um, but I decided to do something different, and I hope you'll, you'll bear with me on this, because this is actually a paper that I, um, that I wrote and a speech that I gave uh, for, a, for an organization called the National Association of Victorian Scholars. Now, Victorian scholars, these are people who study Victorian culture as it comes out of England and, and sort of moves through Europe and, and the Americas. It's a very particular period of time, but it's, it's kind of interesting for us because Victoria reigned from 1837, I guess, 27, can't remember now. Um, but she reigned in this particular part of the 19th century. Right, right through um, the reigns of, of, of our various chiefs and kings, and, and of course, Lili Uokalani. We know that Lili Uokalani um, went to London, England to celebrate the 50th anniversary of her reign uh, in the summer of 1887. I should be able to do the math, but you know, clearly I'm not good at this. Um, 27, 37? 37. 37, thank you. From 1837 to 18. So, so that's, kind of, that's kind of important. In, in its own right. But you have to understand that Victorian scholars, they're very strange people, and mostly they're Caucasians, and they, they really focus in on everything having to do with Victorian literature, uh, Victorian essays, uh, Victorian plays, Victorian dress, and manners. And so when I wrote this, what I was trying to do was, well, I was just trying to write a speech at first. And then it became clearer as I, as I wrote this that there was something really, really important about European culture and manners to our chiefs, and particularly to the royals. And since uh, a lot of the work that you do involves being really close to that royal family, especially the Kalakawas, um, through Iolani Palace, um, I thought you might really enjoy this paper. You're either going to really enjoy it or you're going to hate it, but we're, either way, we're going. So uh, here's this glossary that you probably don't need. They did. Um, so ali'i, ali'i nui, haoli, kuhina nui, mohai, which I'm going to talk about in, in just in, in a few minutes, mo'i and mo'olelo. These are uh, the stories, that, the Hawaiian, olelo Hawaii, that, that appear throughout this, this, this talk. Now, this is going to be different than when I gave this speech, uh, because when I gave this speech, I had like 35 minutes, and it had to be done. In our case, we have a little more time, and if there's any point that you want to interrupt me, because you just don't, you know, because this isn't making sense, feel free. All right. There is a story that we tell our young people about the political rise of the high chief, Ali Inui, Kamehameha, and the ceremonial sacrifice, or Mohai, of Imaka Koloa in 1782. Here, Kamehameha signaled his readiness to assume leadership of the Hawaii Island chiefly families by grasping the corpse of the slain rebel chief who was being dedicated to Ku. Now, you may not know this story, but in the last year of Kalaniopu'u's reign, Kalaniopu'u had been Mo'i of Hawaii Island for 20 years. He'd fought all these epic battles. Mostly he lost those battles to Kahekiliahumanu on Maui. Um, but he was a fierce military kind of Mo'i. And before he died, he arranged this huge kind of uh, campaign 
to go down into Ka'u, where Ka'u has always been sort of rebellious um, to the rest of the um, Hawaii Island chiefs, to go down into Ka'u and capture and kill uh, this rebel leader, Ali'i, named Imaka Koloa. And when they did, um, it was arranged that Imaka Koloa should be, should be laid out as Mohai, as, as a dedication to Kuka Ilimoku. And it should be presided over by Kalaniopu'u's son and heir, yeah? Kivala'o. And you may have heard this story before that in, in the actual ceremony, there was, I'm going to actually say this now, so I'll get back to the story here. Here, Kamehameha signaled his readiness to assume leadership of the Hawaii Island chiefly fami families by grasping the corpse of the slain rebel chief who was being dedicated to Ku. In fact, the ceremony was not intended to elevate Kamehameha, but to signify his subordination to his cousin, Kivala'o, who had been designated to inherit the political su supremacy from his father, Kalaniopu. Thus, there were two offerings at that mohai. Huh? The corpse of Imakokoloa, which was to be grasped by the designated supreme chief, Mo'i, and the body of a pig, which was to be grasped at the same time by the chiefly subordinate to the Mo'i. Kivala'o is said to have been repulsed by the appearance of the human corpse and did not reach out to grasp it, leaving Kamehameha the opportunity, and some would say the responsibility, for grasping the Mo'ai and leaving the pig for his superior. Mohai was not ever a ceremony to appease a deadly god of war. There was nothing in the ceremony to suggest appeasement. In fact, Mohai was always done in preparation for war and suggested the great seriousness of battle and the discipline and sacrifice that warfare would require. Kamehameha grasped these things. And Kivala'o did not, which is one reason why the latter was killed a scant month later, month later and Kamehameha began his rise to power. To realize how greatly our society changes just within the lifespan of Kamehameha, who may have been 40 years old when Cook, Captain Cook and Clerk, arrived on their voyage in 1778. One need only realize that all of the warfare rituals in which Kamehameha participated in 1782 had remained largely unchanged for hundreds of years. By the time he died in 1819, he had ceased the practice of Mohai, had commanded a law protecting travelers, elders, and children from being harmed while they were traveling about, about the kingdom, and tended to favor European military dress when posing for portraits, portraits themselves being a wholly new innovation to Hawaiian society. The changes wrought by Kamehameha in his lifetime would be eclipsed by the work of his son, Kauikiauli, Kamehameha III, who after years of resisting the ideology and training of American, uh, of American Protestant missionaries, Kauikiauli would personally oversee a modernization of the Hawaiian political structure, and with the advice and consultation of American missionary William Richards, would create a constitutional government, designing a legislature of chiefs and a house of representatives, and would seek international recognition of Hawaii as a nation state, all within about five years. This is a picture of um, Ha'alilio, Timothy Ha'alilio, who accompanied William Richards on a lengthy uh, journey to the United States, Britain, and France to secure recognition in 1842 and 1843. Uh, it's, it's a journey that Ha'alilio ha did not return from. Before he died in 1854, and now I'm referring to Koe Kiauli again, before he died in 1854 at the age of 41, he had also presided over the transformation of the ancient land tenure system into a system modeled after European and American systems of private ownership of land, protected by laws, and was a witness to the rapid rise of a sugar plantation industry that would eventually dominate the economy of the kingdom, recruit and import Chinese, 
Japanese, and European contract laborers who would collectively outnumber the native population before the end of the century. They would make a number of Howley families, many of them descendants of American missionaries, fabulously wealthy and powerful. You might want to take a look at some of these um, here. Go to the next slide and the next one. This Mo'olelo, this story of our people in this land, has had no shortage of chroniclers. And some of those narrators have told what I see as a Victorian story. What I mean is that the tale of the transformation of life and society in Hawaii can be seen through the eyes of individuals who are themselves the products of Victorian era educations and manners, like Isabella Byrd, Samuel Clemens, Jack London, Robert Louis Stevenson, Thomas Thrum, and even Martha Beckwith. There were thousands of pages of observations by missionary families, Armstrong, Andrews, Bingham, Dole, Thurston, Whitney, E.O. Hall, Hyde, Rice, and Wilcox. And while the work of the great, late great American historian of Hawaii, Ralph Simpson Kuykendall, was squarely a product of the 20th century, it can be argued that he saw the world through the mind of an earlier sensibility, through a, a Victorian mind. Collectively, these, these historians and participants in our history created a kind of super narrative that framed the popular conception of Hawaii and Kanaka Maoli until the last decade of the 20th century. The result of that framing, especially for native Hawaiian scholars and political activists at the turn of the century, at the turn of this last century, um, was a forceful and sometimes bitter denunciation of the Haole Academy, which we believed and continue to believe had consigned the native to a passive victimization, silent as our culture and language passed into oblivion, generous hosts or resentful social failures as Hawaii fulfilled its destiny as a model of American liberalism and racial harmony. So the beginning of a vibrant and transform transforming native scholarship and the cultural and political renaissance of the past 40 years has quite understandably critiqued the ideological and social foundations of empire and colonialism. Among scholars of Hawaii, the principal focus has been on a critique of the United States, capitalism, and the evangelical missions of the 19th century. Rather little obvious research, however, has looked at Victorian manners and sensibilities that perhaps had a more direct influence on the Hawaiian kingdom, even if mostly on those who ruled it. In recent native scholarship, the earlier colonial analysis led by Trask and others, including myself, has been criticized for leaving little room for understanding the agency of native political leaders. Kamanamai Kalani Beamer's 2014 book, No Mako Kamana, has questioned our thesis that native rulers were misguided and misled by generations of missionaries, government officials, travelers, and foreign residents, and that Western education and political advice created a political society that was foreign and ill-fitting to us. So that's, that's basically my earlier belief. When I wrote Dismembering Lahui, law was an instrument of our dispossession. It was introduced basically um, to separate us from our land and from our culture and our traditions and our, uh, and our power. So people like um, Kamana Beamer are questioning that and saying, look, um, Hawaiians were smart. Our, our chiefs understood the world. And they accepted these innovations and hybridized them. That's the word that he uses. We made those institutions into institutions that would serve us, that included strong elements of our culture. And, and, and he's right, um, but we'll get to that. <coughs> he's not completely right. Um, OK, so but what we were saying was that what, what happened was that a political so society that was foreign and ill-fitting to us and that actually facilitated our takeover in fairly short order. Along with other contemporary native scholars, such as Donovan Preza, 
Kuhio, Vogler, and Keanu Tsai, Beamer insists that the Hawaiian Kingdom government was a hybridized institution. Its leaders, Arali'i and Mo'i, proactively selected elements of European ideas and articulated them with traditional practices and understandings. I think they make a compelling case, but thus far no one has taken a closer look at the differing and complex global cultures that were presenting themselves to the Hawaiians and affecting the emerging cosmopolitan society that was the 19th century kingdom. In other words, okay, so Europeans and Americans have these institutions that we, um, we saw and we um, assimilated proactively. What about other cultures? What about Japan? What about China? Um, what about the people that were actually coming from other places as well? And, and I'm making the point that um, if you're going to assume that there was some kind of cultural um, convergence, we might think in larger terms than simply Europe. Um, it seems to me that one may very well begin this daunting examination of global cultural influence with Victorian England and especially when one looks at the royal families, Hawaiian and British, between 1855 and 1893. This next part is me trying to be funny with the Victorians. So if you don't think it's funny, it's all right. Um, it is one of the humorous ironies in my life that I would not only be addressing a conference of Victorian scholars, but that I would be ready to acknowledge that your research, your understanding of the literature, historical context and colonial foundation of Victorian culture could hold an important key for Kanaka Maoli's understanding of our own culture as Europeans entered our world. And up to this very moment, when identity has become so convoluted in terms of ancestry, race, national histories, imperialism, religious conversion, economic and environmental change, dislocation, even to the point of actual disappearance of our lands, militarization, and even the rise of a new global class warfare in which so many of us are not only, are not only native people, but wage laborers and paupers. I forgot the humorous part. For indigenous studies practitioners, whose founders of this discipline are like me, well into our third decade of research and teaching, we are almost reflexively dismissive of the word Victorian as it has always been associated for us with beliefs and values as destructive to native identity as the evangelical missions, European settlers and their plantations, and the world wars conducted on our, on, on our lands for the sake of large and powerful colonial empires. But wait, it gets funnier. My own dismissal of European, of Victorian mores and conduct comes from the fact that I was an American teenager in the 1960s. Part of the infamous generation that scorned any social conduct that didn't support our pursuit of libertine pleasures, feminism, political cynicism, civil rights, the end of the military draft, and for the most part, all at the same time. That upbringing alone makes me surprised and grateful that if I can even make a coherent statement about identity now. The truth is, I think I know who I am. And I'm fairly certain that Kanaka Maoli of the mid-19th century also knew who they were, despite the fact that their education was wholly different from their parents. As for the ruling chiefly families, not only was their education different, but so was their level of sophistication about the greater world, their familiarity with law and international politics, and their understanding of what was expected of them as ali'i. What they had been for a hundred generations seemed to transform naturally into Victorian gentility. Alfred Korn published Victorian Visitors in 1980. In, in 1980, but it's, it's a collection of, 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 of earlier writings. It's a narration around a, a collection of letters from Lady Jane Franklin and her, and her cousin, Sarah Krakow, who visited the Hawaiian Islands in the, in the, in the 1860s. Korn also exam examines the journal entries of Queen Emma Kaleleonalani Rook, 
who visited England a few years after the death of her deaths of her husband and child. Victorian visitors is not a systematic analysis of Victorian influences on the Ali'i, but there are clear signs that the Lady Franklin and her companion had a greater affinity with some of the high chiefs, the king, Alexander Liho Liho, and his part English queen, Emma, not to mention the high chief, Kalaakaua, than they did with Americans generally. After dining with the royal family, Krakoft observes, it is certain that a blind man would never have guessed the color and antecedents of the royal people. Though thorough refinement and intellectual polish pervading all they did and said. But now listen to her description of another host, American Merritt Gower, while traveling in Ka'u. Mr. Gower is a perfect specimen in externals of the Yankee. Tall, lanky, with long sloping shoulders, sallow complexion, and a face that must be seen to be conceived the predominant character being that of, a perf of perfect self-satisfaction. His tones are ultra-Yankee, and his expression no less so. <clears throat> but he has been most kind to us, and absolutely refused payment for the stores, many of them imported and therefore costly, with which he has supplied our needs. Nevertheless, he is a Yankee to the backbone, as was evidenced by the way in which he spoke of the annexation of these islands to America. We were protesting against it. This is 1860s. We were protesting against it and said we could not conceive it could be done except by force, in which case England would intervene. He argued, well, I guess it would be the wisest thing the king could do. How so? How can you expect a sovereign to resign his power and kingdom voluntarily? Well, I suppose we look at it from different points of view. But I should say that he would be better off with a few hundred thousand dollars to live upon than he is now, than he is now as king. The almighty dollar. That's how she ends that particular phrasing. Not every British traveler to Hawaii was as condescending to Americans. Isabella Byrd, who traveled in Hawaii in the early 1870s, tended to be much more respectful of what the American missionaries had accomplished. Yet she cannot stem a tart critique of Americans whenever her thoughts turn toward the likelihood of America's annexation of Hawaii. Speaking of the kingdom's population, she says, it is a pity for many reasons that it is dying out. It has shown a singular aptitude for politics and civilization. And it would have been interesting to observe the development of a strictly Polynesian monarchy starting under passively fair conditions. Whites have conveyed to these shores slow but infallible destruction on the one hand, and on the other, the knowledge of the life that is to come. And the rival influences of blessing and cursing have now been 50 years at work, producing results with which most reading people are familiar. Much as I like America, she says, I shrink from the day when her universal political, political corruption and her unrivaled political immorality shall be naturalized on Hawaii. As tempting as it is to see British perceptions of difference between Americans and themselves as merely the consequences of their mutual political competitions, such a simplification makes it difficult to take real cultural differences seriously. It is intriguing to think that British high society perceived a cultural affinity, a connection, with the ruling Ali'i in Hawaii, which they did not feel with their former subjects from, Amer from America. And we could raise all sorts of questions about cultural identity and the relative importance of shared beliefs and values over the other issues like language and even race. I, however, would prefer to focus on the political implications of Victorian refinements and manners and suggest a plausible connection with the Americans' political and military takeover of our country in 1893 and 1900. I had the great pleasure, um, back when I wrote this, uh, that spring of reading uh, Dr. Tiffany Ng Tsai's dissertation, uh, which, by the way, is being turned into a book, should be out in a, in a year or two uh, through UH Press. 
um, her dissertation on the discursive assassination of King David Kalakaua. When I say discursive assassination, I mean basically she details precisely how um, a s relatively small group of mostly American businessmen in Hawaii who were political opponents of the king uh, basically destroyed his reputation not only um, in the 1870s and 80s, but seemingly for all time. Um, what she calls the king's literary, literary genealogy of misrepresentation. So while her point, after perusing more than 7,000 different statements and articles about Kalakaua, 7,000 different statements uh, written in English, French, Hawaiian, from around the world, um, really, is that the contemporary view of the man actually comes, our contemporary view of Kalakaua as a wastrel, as a libertine, as you know, a drunkard, as useless, as foolish, actually comes from a handful of ugly and slanderous stories about him, which Sai claims were manufactured by his political opponents. This is one of them, the Reverend Sereno Bishop. I found it intriguing that these opponents were almost without exception Americans. Lady, Frank, Lady Franklin and Sarah Krakoff's disdainful comments about Americans in Hawaii caused me to wonder if Reverend Sereno Bishop and Lauren Thurston were simply slandering the king and later his sister Lili Uokalani for political reasons only, or if there did not exist a real antipathy yeah, between Americans and Hawaiian ali'i that was in part a cultural difference in values and behavior. There was certainly a significant difference between our civilizations over the status and role of women. But I will leave that discussion to others who have a much better grasp of how women are oppressed in the emerging modern society. I will only point out that I have, what I have said in previous publications. Historically, our female ali'i were occasionally supreme chiefs, usually powerful, and were even warriors in combat. When the constitution of the kingdom was formed in 1840, ali'i wahine were members of the legislature in the House of Nobles and continued to be appointed until 1844. Um, Ruth Ke'ili Kolani was the last to be appointed to the House of Nobles, and after her, no one else, um, no other female. Women were not specifically excluded from voting and election to the legislature until the 1852 Constitution. So the original 1840 Constitution makes no mention of uh, whether women can be in office or vote or cast their votes for, for um, different politicians. Um, and this is not done specifically until 1852. In my education, Victorian society was synonymous with the political oppression of women, while at the same moment confining them to a status as higher beings, with elevated morals and grace. But in Hawaii, it is harder to state categorically that women were denied political power or placed on pedestals. It would, it would be more accurate to say that the new forms of Western government were not meant to include them. But they continued to rule in traditional ways as island governors and as Kuhina Nui, a kind of premier, and three women very near, nearly succeeded very powerful kings as sovereigns. Pawahi, who declined nomination, Emma, who lost an election, and Lili'u Okalani, who became queen. Though somewhat less than sovereign due to the disgraceful constitution forced upon her brother, the status of women in Hawaii was a fairly complicated thing, as it perhaps is everywhere. In fact, I think about all of the contributions, contributors, contributors to this paper, travelers, rulers, writers, and scholars, and I realize how much women have had to say about the cultural and political conflicts between Hawaiian and Haole in the 19th century. The foundational critique for Kanaka Maoli comes from Hanani K. Trask and her epic 1983 essay on James Cook, Cultures in Collision. Indeed, Trask makes no distinction between the English and the Americans ultimately when she writes, these cultures, I will argue, were as polarized as cultures can be. 
The European and the Polynesian worlds differed in major ways. Economic, or economic organization, social and political organization, and cultural and environmental valuation. In their moral relationships and their appreciation of the individual and the collective, these societies were worlds apart. I believe that Trask's observations were correct, and yet I wonder how long we maintain that polarization. It was truly a marvel how quickly, how quickly Kanaka Maoli became literate, and not just able to decipher the symbols of a written language, but literate in the knowledge and understanding of the world that was available to them through print. Hinano Brumaljim's 2012 master's thesis on Henry Opukahaya that documents, documents the amazing com accomplishments of that expatriate Kanaka in the eight years, in his eight years at the Foreign Mission School, translating Genesis from the Hebrew directly into Hawaiian, and without assistance, reformatting the Latin alphabet to represent the phonemes of our language while doing so. But it is the work of young scholar Brian Kamauli. Kuwata, that in my mind has the most intriguing implications for our understanding of the 19th century Hawaiian society. In several articles, he examines how our newspapers published Hawaiian translations, like Tarzan and Ivanhoe, of several classic European texts, including the French story Bluebeard, Shakespeare's The Tempest, Ivanhoe, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Arabian Nights, and even Bur uh, Burroughs' Tarzan of the Apes. The popularity of these stories, along with the biographies of Disraeli, Gladstone, Washington, and Lincoln, all suggest that Hawaiians found European literature appealing, per perhaps in ways not totally dissimilar from how our own cultural forms like hula appear appeal to foreigners. Kuwata recognizes that Hawaiians also wrote their own epic stories, Hiaka i Kapolio Pele, Laie Kawai, both Wahine, among the most famous, and also wrote biographies of King Kalaakaua, Kamehameha, the famed legislator Joseph Navahi, known as the Gladstone of the Pacific, and Robert Wilcox. Kuwata argues, as did Noi Noi Silva in Aloha Betrayed, that some of these stories have an obvious political intent to inspire Hawaiian patriotism, and later to contest other mostly American nar narratives minimizing Hawaiian heroic, heroic figures at a time when America was in the process of taking over the Hawaiian Islands. But in one of his articles, Kuwata stresses that European stories appearing, appearing in the Hawaiian language um, did not simply translate a text from French or English into Hawaiian. Plot, characters, and even the morals of the story tran were transformed in order to make the story, Blueberry, for example, relevant or even credible to Hawaiian audiences. This hybridization of literature accompanies Beamer's hybridization of law and political forms and of Christian conversion and traditional religious practice in Hawaii as well. Many 19th century observers and more recent historians have suggested that the Ali'i adopted certain European cultural forms to strengthen their political position with Americans and Europeans in the 19th century. So the argument that was made, and, and, and this, is, this is literature that I'm pretty familiar with from the 1960s and 70s and 80s when I was a student is that we copied European forms in order to, you know, to creep closer to their kinds of powerful positions. But that will not quite explain the popularity of classical European literature in our language among the masses of Hawaiian readers. I mean, so if the, 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 the Ali'i are doing this and the chiefs are doing this, it doesn't explain why these, these forms are popular to us to the point that we want to translate them and read them ourselves. There's something else going on here. Nor will, nor will it explain the easy grace with which young men and women like Alexander Liholiho, his queen Emma, Kalaakaua, and Liliuokalani moved between the still existing rituals of Hawaiian society and those of the Europeans and Americans. 
We also should be clear that our people did not adopt the English-friendly social graces of Victorian society because this was expected by the powerful white elites in Hawaii. On the contrary, Americans tended to regard European manners with disdain. At best, a quaint set of anachronisms that diverted valuable time from making money, and at worst, a veneer disguising and sheltering a rotting, archaic elite. In 1883, the Saturday Press printed this attack on Kalakaua that is startling in its viciousness, but also deeply revealing of, the, of this American disdain. Kalakaua is a chief of a tribe of not quite 50,000 people, and his grandfather, if not his father, was a naked cannibal savage. But after being feted on terms of equality in London, Rome, and Vienna, it is no wonder that he should go back to Honolulu, resolve to live on his paltry revenue in his finest style as his brother's sovereigns in civilized countries. What we wish our Kalaakaos and Sehuayos to see is just what they are least able to comprehend. What they observe and remember most is just what it is least expedient that they should aspire to copy. It should not surprise Americans to be told that their ancestors respected neither European nor Kanaka Maoli Marlaks, but I wonder if they can understand just how contemptuous our own people were of their rough lack of manners and graces and their arrogant assumptions. Indeed, how like barbarians they seemed. And I wonder how it might, for native Hawaiians, affect our own scholarship to acknowledge that the transforming influences in our society did not just come from white colonizers generally, but were the results of how native people perceived and accommodated hundreds of different cultures and traditions during the rapid changes of the 19th century. Indeed, it is when we look at this shifting culture in Hawaii during the long, this long Victorian period that we get glimpses of what national sovereignty might have meant in the world and what it clearly meant to Kanaka Maoli. Long before international agencies defined, you know, like the UN, long before international agencies defined the meanings of nationalism and national sovereignty, linking those meanings, not so surprisingly, to land, resources, and wealth, Kanaka Maoli understood sovereignty to be the development and protection of our own culture, sui generis its own culture. I would not be surprised if Lota Kapuaiva, who read extensively, had been familiar with Matthew Arnold's crit critique of mechanized and merchant-dominated society in Culture and Anarchy. This is, a, this is a, a, an essay that he wrote. And while reading, he might have pondered the unique and beautiful culture that we were creating in Hawaii. These are Matthew Arnold's words. If culture, then, is the study of perfection and of harmonious perfection, general perfection, and perfection which consists of becoming something, becoming something rather than having something, in an inward, inward condition of the mind and spirit, not in the outward set of circumstances, it is clear that culture, instead of being the frivolous and useless thing which many liberals are apt to call it, has a very important function to fulfill for mankind. The Hawaiian Kingdom, with its cacophonous bilingual legislatures, the legislature was conducted during the period of the kingdom in English and Hawaiian, and occasionally other kinds of languages joined that fray, and people tended to know them. Um, cacophonous bilingual, bilingual legislatures, educated, refined, and graceful royal families, quickly growing multi-ethnic populations, yeah? Asian, Haole, and Kanaka, huge numbers of people intermarrying, you know, um, and creating this whole hapa group of people. Um, and still vital and vibrant native arts, hula, music, poetry, and yet also the symbols and signifiers of a modern country almost everywhere you looked. Newspapers in English or Hawaiian, 
paved streets and streetcars, carriages, dance halls, and opera houses, and churches of practically every Christian stripe with several Buddhist and Shinto denominations as well. Honolulu was as cosmopolitan as San Francisco, and arguably more so when it was not an American place. And this, of course, is part of the tragedy of the American takeover, because the Americans had no intention of allowing this place to remain sui generis, its own culture, its own nation. Would the poet Arnold not have found it an especially disturbing tragedy when vulgar, contemptuous, money-fixated Americans plundered the gracious palace of Kalaakaua, disassembled the amazing multilingual lingual legislatures and colorful celebrations of our ali'i, our chiefs, and began the relentless suppression of the Hawaiian language, removing all references to the ancient stories of our people and any history of the theft of our kingdom from the schools and textbooks. When the late, great 19th century historian Joseph Poi Poi wrote and published that mo'olelo that I shared about Kamehameha at the beginning of this talk, when he described the way that Kamehameha seized or took hold of the sacrifice chief Ibaka Koloa, Poi Poi used the word lalao, which simply means to grasp or to take hold of. If I were to retell this story in my language, I would use the word aapo, to grasp, but in both senses, that grasp has in English to take hold of and to understand. Our people reached out unafraid and grasped what we could of the immense array of objects and ideas that arrived with foreigners in Cook's wake, made distinctions among them, came to conclusions about the outer world, and incorporated those distinctions and conclusions into our own behaviors and ideas. Who we were can never be totally grasped, merely by looking at the framework of our laws or government, or even by how we told our own stories or translated the stories of others. Sometimes a description, even a not altogether complimentary one from a visiting Haole, can jolt us with its perception. From Isabella Bird. I am quite interested with a native lady here, the first I have met who has been able to express her ideas in English. She is extremely shrewd and intelligent, very satirical, and a great mimic. She very clear, cleverly burlesques the way in which white people express their admiration of scenery, and in fact, ridicules admiration of scenery for itself. She evidently thinks us a sad, morose, worrying, forlorn race. So many of Byrd's descriptions, observations about our people, and Krakow's as well, point to the physical as well as the emotional grace of Kanaka Maoli in the comfort of our own spaces. How, naturally we, how natural we seem, how fluidly we move, even in the imported holoku gowns of the missionaries. But one last example, a song written by Lili Uokalani, soon to be queen, illustrates how comfortable we were in almost any setting. In the summer of 1887, the queen Kapi Olani and the princess Lili Uokalani traveled with their retinue to London to Buckingham Palace and celebrated along with thousands of others the jubilee of the reign of Victoria. Our queen was the quintessential Victorian writer. One can read her keen observations of the places and people that she met in her international travels. She was also an incisive political analyst, and her autobiography chronicles her attempts to rule our small kingdom and to preserve what could be preserved in the face of the American aggression. But Lili Iwokalani's Mele, written in London, contains something that her prose does not, a recognition of likeness an understanding of the immense responsibility of rule, of the particular burden of being a female ruler in a world that slighted women while paying them no end of compliments and promises. 
This is not, the song, is not an appeal to Victoria. This is a song of thanks and praise, perhaps even a suggestion of wonder that such a little country with a woman holding the scepter could command the respect of the entire world. So you have to know that I wrote this entire thing just so that I could sing this song. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite songs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> It was not irony only that while this princess and her sister-in-law were paying homage to the ruler of the Victorian world, that the sons and grandsons of American missionaries to Hawaii were humiliating her brother the king in Honolulu, forcing him to sign a new constitution that did away with authentic government in Hawaii, and placed the kingdom on the road to annexation. It was also the logical finale to an age of grace and harmonious perfection that was, after all, at least the facade of Victorian society. It was logical, if we look at this from the perspective of those hard-nosed, raw-tongued Americans, that such manners and grace would seem nothing more than cute anachronisms in their pure new world of technology and salesmanship. 
Um, this is a poem by Matthew Arnold. And I have loved this poem from the time I was like a young undergraduate in the English department at UH Hilo. And I didn't know exactly why um, I love this poem. It, it really made no sense to me then, and it only made sense to me as I got older and began to realize um, what it meant as those old social graces in Europe started coming to an end, replacing by the sort of modern ethic of efficiency. Uh, the sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle fertile, furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath, the night wind, down the vast edges drear, and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So this last sentence here, a few sentences here, is really me addressing this audience of Victorian scholars. And I'm going to read it because I think it's still appropriate because of how you work among in this marvelous place, um, among the artifacts and the memories of, of our chiefs, of our king, of our queen. You who have invested your time, whether a few years or a lifetime, in grasping the meaning and consequence of the Victorian world, may have something to say in response to some questions from a scholar and historian who has only begun to take this notion of culture seriously. What did it mean? And can we answer this question by acknowledging and respecting the dignity and capacity of the Ali'i who appear to have embraced that culture so naturally and elegantly? And we, may we not wonder what in our modern Americanized society has taken the place of that culture, especially in the areas of ideals and appreciation for beauty, in the way at least some of those people valued culture as Arnold understood it where worldly achievement and wealth were only part of what made a distinguished and accomplished individual, that the way one held oneself and respected others mattered. I think, um, I think this is a good song to close with. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about it. You all know this song, and there's no reason why we can't, except we can't maybe see all of the words here. We can certainly do the second verse that we can see. Yeah. Uh, What I love most about this song is, um, is the way that it's actually a song sort of capturing a photographic moment at Mount Wili, where um, the queen, well, princess then, in the 1870s, I think she wrote this, where the princess were, was with, with a number of other members of her family and some of her attendants, and they were enjoying the uh, hospitality of the Boyd family, the other ancestors of, of Manu Boyd. And, you know, the, the Boyds were tremendous patriots um, and, and really close friends of the royal family. And I keep thinking about, you know, how they might go to Mauna um simply to get away from the affairs of state to escape. Um, my daughter, who writes about this as well, the importance of getting into nature for Kanaka Maldi, to get up into the forest, to, to be away to really separate yourself um, from, from all the things that we build that, that hem us in. Um, and I think about this. 
they must have enjoyed themselves tremendously. And perhaps one, one young woman enjoyed herself more than others, um, because this is clearly a song that captures a moment when, when someone is saying goodbye to somebody. And, I don't know who it was. Some people say it was Like Like, but we always say that about Like Like. That's the truth, you know, so you should never, should never assume that's necessarily true. But she did have lots of affairs, Like Like. And she wrote about them. You know that, right? Uh, that's, that's her love song to some surfer. And we know it's a lover because, you know, her husband did not surf. He was a holy guy. <laughs> Just keep those things in mind. There is some truth to the fact that, that um, to, to the notion that Like Like um, had multiple lovers, but it's not necessarily true that this was written for her, unless you want it to be. It doesn't hurt either. I can't do this. Sorry. It's just not. My daughter thinks I shouldn't play this guitar. Because, not this one. <laughs> but I love playing it because it's easier to play as I get older. The, the nylon strings don't cut into my hands like the Martin. And I can play this guitar all day, as long as I don't mind it being out of tune. because my daughter's name is Holly Ann. Now you should be joining me. Chance to sing down and sing about their verse. Mau po po kui kei kanani na pua rose o mau na wi ila ila ya ya 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Osorio. Um, now's our time for question and answer, but really I'd just like a hana ho. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's, that's okay. why I do this. <laughs> is my question and answer. Um, we can certainly do another song. Maybe there should the be a question. microphone so that the recording can pick up that. Question. Yes, yes. Not, not to amplify our voices. You mentioned a scholar earlier, uh, Kuwada, Kuwada. Brian Kuwada, yes. Brian Kuwada, okay, that's what I wanted to know, thank you. So Brian Kuwada is um, currently working at Kamehameha Schools in their publishing department. Don't tell anybody, but we're trying to steal him back to the university. Um, yes, it, what, the work that he's doing for Kamehameha is really, really important, but um, he needs to finish his PhD and he needs to be teaching the rest of us how to do these kinds of translation studies. He's really amazing, um, and he's, he's still pretty young. Anybody else? Song request? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? No, yes, sir. How's it going, doctor? My name's Harvey. Hi. Um, so you mentioned the, the poem, the last poem, I forget who, who was Dover by, Beach, it's called. Right, or Matthew, is, it's called Dover's Beach? Dover Beach, yeah. Matthew so Arnold. you mentioned in it that you had an appreciation for it that you hadn't really understood. Right. At what point did you find the understand, or like did you find and understand your appreciation for that poem, at least? And then how does that compare to deeper levels of appreciation and perhaps even devotion for other forms of writing that you may have gotten into uh, through your academic experience? That's a really cool question, Harvey. Um, so that's one of the really, really important things about th that I feel are, are really the best parts of American um, academic education, the liberal university, the way that, that Americans have conceived it have been one of the true blessings, I think, of the 20th century. And part of the reason for that is because you get exposed in this, in this system, you really are exposed to a great many things. I mean, sooner or later, the Americans want you to get serious and start making money. And they tell you that, really, almost from the time you enroll, right? Yeah, it's, it's good. You don't want to be an English major. Art history, don't, don't be silly. How are you going to make a living? But the fact is that we do actually have those courses, and you can take them, and you, and you can immerse yourself in, into an appreciation of, of how writers and artists really think and see and conceive the world, and how they understand beauty, and how they understand, um, how they understand the, the place of human beings in the world. So, you know, I learned all of these things as an undergraduate when I'm in my, 19s, in my teens and 20s. 
And I just think, oh, this is, you know, this is silly. I, mean, I like the way this sounds, but I don't know what it means. And then as you become older and you realize how really mechanized our society is and, and how there are all these expectations and how there are, there are, so much of life is almost like a factory. Even for people in academia, you get up and you go to a job and you, know, and, and you do this for four months and you either graduate people or, or you kick them out, um, but then you start all over again and it just seems like this endless train. At what point do you begin to recognize that there are other things in the world that you should be appreciating? Um, your family, spouse, children, what they're doing, you know, the, the things that someti sometimes we take for granted. And it, it took me a while to figure that out. Uh, I don't even want to say how long. It, it, it was relatively recent. <laughs> <laughs> it was relatively recent. I'm glad I lived so long. Yeah. Um, and what that means, I think, for um, how, I, how I think people should get an education is that you know, we, we shouldn't be curtailing them. We shouldn't be trying to force them into particular paths so early. Um, education should be just as broad and, and as full of useless things, things that we th think are useless, as you, can possibly, as you can possibly put in there. Because um, they do eventually create unique and marvelous individuals. Okay, I promise, I promise I'll sing that, but it'll have to be the last thing I do because it is the, um, it's, it's a rule. In our family, we, f we finish with that song. Jamie. Hi, Sasha Oshara. Thank you for your uh, program today. It's, and my question has to do with the 1852 Constitution where you said women were disenfranchised from the vote. I wondered what prompted that and what was the response of uh, female Hawaiians across the kingdom? You know, I, that's, and I'm going to first of all say, I don't know, because it, it wasn't until after I, okay, so just so you know, right, we all have blind spots. When I, when I think today, especially of all the things that we've learned about, um, about women and women's rights and, and those sorts of things, I should not have been so blind to this. I noticed... I noticed only that women were dissent, disenfranchised from the, from the Council of Chiefs, um, basically from the House of Nobles. That in 1844, Ruth Kelly Kolani was named to the House of Nobles, and she served until she died. She was, she was also governor of Hawaii Island, Kiaina. Um, she had political roles. It, it occurred to me then, look at this, you know, when I was writing um, my dissertation and writing Dismembering Lahui, I said, look at this. Um, so you have um, high chiefs like Emma and, and Pawahi who don't even get to, to, to be in the House of Nobles. This clearly indicates, right, that, that a European, a Euro-American sensibility had really taken over. They were just being really obvious now about their takeover. But I never stopped to think about whether or not women had been voting until 1852. I'd always assumed that they didn't. I'd always assumed that from the time Kaui Keauli made his constitution in 1839, that when he said Maka Ainana could, could, could vote, that it was only the males. There is, nothing in, there is nothing in the constitution that says that. And there, is, there was no reason for me to jump to the conclusion that it was only men except that I was, you know, I was a man. <laughs> so so he, here's the thing. In <coughs> Kaui Keuli is the, really the originator of this modernization effort. And as long as he was strong and, 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 and well, um, he, he basically ran those renovations. He ran. He, he ran all of those things, um, mostly through some really trusted people like E.E. E. Um, and um, 
Well, there, there were others as well. But in, in the 1850s, he begins to tire, and, and, and he's ill a lot. Um, and he's going he's gonna to die in 1854. Um, and what begins to happen is that um, Howley in the, in the House of Representatives, because that's really where they are. They're not really in the House of Nobles at this point. They're only in the House of Representatives. And in 18, 1850, the kingdom actually passed laws allowing non-Kanaka to run for, for House of Representatives and to, and to represent themselves, so long as, so long as they were um, sworn subjects. More and more come into the House of Representatives in 1850 and 1851. And by 1852, there's, uh, they're really asserting themselves that the, the constitution that was originally put together by Kawikia Uli and, and chiefs and some of his Kanaka Maoli advisors is not suitable to the task of a, of a modern nation. And they want reforms. And so um, there is a committee of people put together to... Um, to basically draft this, this, this new constitution. William Little Lee, the attorney from the United States. George, his last name is escaping me now. Um, George something or other. He's, he's like one of the first Supreme Courts, Howley Supreme Courts of the kingdom. And his picture is up in, in, um, um, uh, in the Judiciary History Center Museum. And his name will come to me in a minute. But he was British, and he was appointed to this, and John Papai'i. Those three basically crafted the new constitution. And they made it explicit that women would not participate, because in no other European country, or America, certainly not in the United States, were women allowed to vote at that time. So basically, they were saying, look, you, know, you, you, you want to be more like the Europeans. You want to be more like them. And, 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 and have the respect of other countries. You can't have women voting. And so they passed it. Was there an outcry? I didn't see it. But I didn't examine the same kinds of, of places that I would examine now. So I, I read through mostly English newspapers in the 1850s. And I would always read through the letter section to see, whether, to see what people were saying in English. Um, but I think that if somebody were to devote themselves to the task of looking in and around 1851 and 1852 to responses in Hawaiian, uh, they might find a different, a different thing entirely. Um, so I did, yeah. when you're telling the story about um, Kamehameha and um, the choosing, the, he'll grab the corpse and just everything leading up to that um, about how clearly not only is he a great warrior, but it's a warrior people and that 400 or 1,000 Oahuans are willing to go off the Pali to try to yeah. remain Oahu. And then how do we get to the Bayonet Constitution? When do you think that that warrior people, is it you know, with his first son, his second son, where does that change that feeling that they will fight and they will die before they would give up even to another chief? Well, you know, my own belief is that the, the most serious thing that happens is this tremendous depopulation that is, is actually taking place even while Kamehameha is you know, beginning his conquest. So one of the things that we know, for instance, is that um, the population of Hawaii was much, much larger um, before Cook arrived. And in Cook's wake, there is um, an explosion of epidemics that carve into, um, you know, in, into Hawaiian society. And it's taking chiefs, and it's taking people. Uh, but just to give us a really good understanding. By the time Kamehameha died, the population was likely at least only a half of what it had been um, prior to the arrival of Cook. And that's by using the most conservative estimates of what that population was. If you use David Stannard's estimations, then the population at that point was a quarter of what it had been. 
And I'm going to say, first of all, that, um, that the warrior culture that, that, that grew up in Hawaii, that emerged in Hawaii, was based on a number of, uh, of things. First of all, lots of people and lots of chiefs. The Ali'i were the principal warriors, and they were raised, um, they, they were raised and taught um, the art of battle. And, and the, I'm going to sing another song in a minute because that'll, that'll help. Um, the art of battle and the values and the, and, and, and the values that went with that. Um, warfare, warfare as our chiefs and people understood it is so different from how we think of warfare today, which is the development of techniques and tools and numbers sufficient that you can overwhelm an enemy hold territory, change people's political lives. That's not what warfare was like um, in, in, in Hawaii um, in, in the ancient days. Warfare was, was much more ceremonial, and it was much more about pitting yourself personally against um, a hoapayo, yeah, against an opponent. Um, if, if you look at the whole record of of fighting that took place among our chiefs um, prior to, really prior to the rise of Kalani Opu'u and Kahikili and others and Kamehameha, you'll see that very little of that was about conquest, conquest and occupation. It was really about raids and winning and then going back home. And I can, I can tell you that this is really the story of our chiefs really up until the time of Kamehameha. And then, you know, this, as this is changing, it still doesn't take away, you know, the, the, the ceremonial aspects of, of, of fighting. What probably did was the gun and, the, and, you know, the musket and the killing from a distance because there's no horse, there's no cavalry. Everything is really man to man and it's, and it's infantry and it's, close order combat, and you, it's kill or be killed, and it's usually pitting chiefs against chiefs as well as left, lesser chiefs against chief, lesser chiefs. I mean, Kamehameha fought. So did Kahekili. They fought in these battles. They didn't just command armies in front of them. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not sure that the warriors of... Yeah, it's, it's not really comparable. And I'm not sure that the warriors of, 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 of Oahu were defending the territory of Oahu. They were defending their honor as, as warriors. And before the superior gunfire, perhaps, of Kamehameha, they went, you know, they went over the pulley. Um, There's much, there's a lot that we need, I think, to, to seriously look at here when we talk about um, battle. And I don't think that it's been looked at seriously enough by anyone. Um, but as always, there are songs <laughs> that tell us a lot about, um, about what those things meant. So here's a song. So in Kamehameha, um, we learned this, um, this chant, Hole Vaimea, and the song that went with it um, when, I was, when I was a student there. And every, every, I think every boy that went to concert glee or, 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 or glee club learned Hole Vaimea. And none of us had the faintest idea what it was about, except, you know, when, when it was dance, men would come up, you know, with, with o'o that could have been spears, you know, just doing this dance and everything. Um, but some of this is clarified when um, John, Johnny Spencer from Kamoela uh, in the 1970s took this older song and then turned it into another song that clearly expresses it as a love song. And when you, when you I want you to think about, um, first of all, who composed this. The song is attributed to 
one of the warriors from Kamehameha's famous Ki Pu'u Pu'u regiment. These were the, these were the, the you know, the warriors who kind of lived up in Kohala, and they would go up into the, up into the hills, into the forests of Kohala. And even today, I mean, even with global warming, it's it's cold up there. And when when the Ki Pu'u Pu'u winds are blowing and that stinging rain hits your skin, you know, we all bundle up. But they would go up bare-chested, practically half naked, and they would cut the, you know, they would they would cut the the uh, the lau for their um, for their spears, these spear makers. And this song, which we think may have, um, it may have referred to a confrontation between Kamehameha's warriors and Keauas somewhere in Hamakua. And Hamakua has these. Um, the fighting in one particular battle was along this ridge. Um, and there is a suggestion that w what the singer is singing about um, is this gesture of love for their opponents and is comparing them to a flower that droops down the side of the, of, of the cliff, that grows actually into the cliff and droops down the side of it um, as men fell to their deaths. Um, and if you listen to the way the song ends, you realize that this is a, a song of love. Kuakula oi kamala nai akeki pu'u Lolu kamaka Zero. What time do we close up here? Uh, that oh no, Zero. All you think? 6.45, we're closing up? <coughs> okay, so we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, I do want to take one of those questions. Uh, <laughs> so um, I know you mentioned you started out as an English major, correct? Yeah. Um, I guess, and now you're the Dean of Hawaiian Studies at Kamakaku Okalani. So I guess, what was the, yes, All right. Um, I guess like what transitioned you into that, uh, I guess into that sort of field in Hawaiian studies, 
um, and inspired you to kind of take up that helm. Yeah. Yeah, I think Hanani K. Tress did. I, I mean, you know, we, um, I had been a musician for 10, 12 years, right up until the time that my partner, Randy Borden, up and left with his family for Washington State. And I, you know, I started playing alone, and I realized I didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And, it was, and, and, and music was a difficult, you know, it was, it was difficult for family. It was difficult for, for practically anything. Um, so when I went back to school, um, I was just looking to find a job someplace you know, that would give me a pension. And um, you know, I, I liked history, and I liked the study of it. I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll teach high school. I liked, I liked European history. I thought maybe I, I, I was taking Greek. I was taking Greek instead of Hawaiian <laughs> as an undergraduate. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> and, um, and then I, you know, I, I heard Hanani Kei speak. I took a class from Lili Kala Kamehameha one summer, and everything everything changed. I realized I realized that that all the questions I used to have about about our own history that I had really I had just sublimated because there was no place to go with them. There, there, nobody was writing. Um, you know the things that people did write about us were profoundly disturbing and and um, insulting. But I didn't, you know, where would you go to know any better than that? And both of those wahine really, they opened up the door. Oh, I, I could find out. And, and here are the places that I could go to find out. So, um, you know, our whole generation then, we were, we were people who were tearing apart that whole American um, approach to research and education, and really trying to build something new in its place. But of the, th of the four of us, Kanalu Young, me, Lili Kala, and, and Hanani Ke, um, really only two of them were really fluent in Hawaiian, or anywhere near fluent, and could actually do research in Hawaiian. And even they didn't. Most of the stuff that we all did was in English texts. That's no longer true. And what has happened because of Hawaiian language, because of you know, the, the great work from, by other scholars um, like um, Noyao Warner and Puakian Nogelmeyer, and, you know, um, and, and then, of course, people from the community, Pat Bacon and Mary Kavena Pukui, we have, we have now um, dozens, and I'm, I'm not, it, we may be getting close to having hundreds of, of Hawaiian scholars capable of doing this research in our language uh, that are now emerging. And they're just pushing us aside, saying, look, if you can't, if you can't keep up, just stay out of our way. <laughs> because we can tell you things about what our ancestors did and what they thought that you guys seem to have missed. And that's, that's how it should be. And, and I have no idea what it will be like in the generation after that. But I can tell you that um, the most exciting things that are happening in Hawaiian scholarship are, are only beginning to happen now. Only beginning to happen now. Do I have time for another song, or do I have to give this up? Well, I have a question. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm a first time tutu, and my mo'opuna is having a baby luau coming up soon. So uh, I'd like to talk to you about entertainment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you can always talk to me about that. No, but um, seriously, my question is, um, are, do you ever plan on revising and your dismembering Lahui? I know um, you had mentioned your viewpoint maybe has changed a bit. Is there a, a version two coming out any time? No. Um, I mean, I've read through it recently and, and realized, and so this is like bragging a little bit, but realizing that it was large enough and that a lot of what I said were more, was much more speculation. speculation. I mean, what do we not know? Um, that I, I, I feel that even with the contemporary scholarship, it still sort of fits pretty well within some of the things that I was raising. 
I was really, really interested at one point in writing um, a history of the Hawaiian in the 20th century. So basically my parents and my grandparents' generation, and mine as well, um, because that's the period of the takeover and that's the period when we were supposedly at our, at our worst, right? You know, couldn't speak our language, basically treated like criminals, all of those things. And yet, you know, again, music. The, the, the music that comes out of the 20th century, the, the romance of it, the beauty of it, the sheer power of, of, of the Hawaiian identity that speaks and the poetry of that music is unbelievable. So how do you square that, right? And how do you square the fact that a, a great, great many of the people who were in, in government were Native Hawaiians? Judges, a lot of policemen, um, <laughs> members of the legislature, um, more than three quarters of the, of the people who represented us in Congress as the delegate were Native Hawaiians. Yeah? Um, Jarrett, like guys like Jarrett and Houston and, and Wilcox and, and Kuhio. Um, I, I just think that they're a really, really interesting group. However, um, the job I have now, um, I, I kind of have to leave it to write that book. And I just got it, so <laughs> I'm not going to leave it just yet. Anyway. I know you have to leave, so um, I did want to do this last song for um, by request. Remind me that I can't use this guitar anymore. Almost. Okay, that's a little. Randy Borden and I wrote this song for George Hellman Kimmel Mitchell. Um, George Hellman actually was, uh, I think he was named after um, William Jarrett, who was, I don't know, like the third or fourth delegate to Congress. Um, I, I can't sing this song without, uh, without thinking about people who have passed, um, people of my generation, and there are more and more of them sort of leaving us all the time. It only has me slightly worried. Um, but we see fewer of them around. Just, um, just a few months ago, Kalani Ohello, who was um, one of the people who fought for um, Kalama Valley and for Waihole and Waikane, he passed away. A lot of our people who have been activists all their lives, when, when they die, they die in poverty. And I wanted you to know that. Um, some of the people who are in pictures that are taken in this, in this pl place here at some of our most vibrant commemorations who have passed um, were houseless. Um, so when I sing this song, I sing for them too. I can recall the way that you had harbored Hawaiian soul How could you leave us You've not been lost at sea You're only wandering Hawaiian soul Send them out to sea. 
Thank you.